Welcome to the UDESIC conference. Please enter your seven-digit PIN now. At the tone, please state your name. When you are finished, please press pound. Please hold for the tone to join your conference. Good morning, everybody. My apologies. We are running a few minutes behind. Um, so we are uh, waiting on uh, just a, a few more minutes, and I promise we will get started here shortly. Again, our apologies. So thank you all for joining us. However, it's a wonderful Tuesday. I can't believe we're coming into May already. And uh, as you can see at this point, Rick is uploading his um, his presentation and sharing his desktop. Um, and um, again, this is a hot topic. And again, we really appreciate you all joining us. And we will get started here shortly. And it looks like um, we have the title slide up, which you should all be able to see at this point. Rick, are you uh, dialed in? I am. Wonderful. Again, everybody, thank you for joining us. We will make this introduction short and get straight to the presentation. Uh, my name is Dion Mishler. I'm the Inside Sales Manager here at New Desk and the moderator for this webcast. Our webcast um, is presented today by Rick Garibay, one of Nudesic's principal consultants, one of our MVPs. He's based out of our Phoenix, Arizona office. He is highly sought after for speaking engagements as well as customer engagements, and we're very pleased that he's able to spend some time with us today. Um, you're logged in, and everybody should see this title slide that says Service-Oriented Architecture with Windows Communication Foundation. Um, so we all, you're all obviously very familiar with the Q&A tools as well as the feedback toolbar. Um, so please keep that feedback coming. Please note with the Q&A as it pertains to this uh, webcast today, we will hold all the questions until the end, and we will go ahead and, and answer them at that time. Um, so lastly, this webcast is being recorded, and we will make it available via the Nudesic website probably in about a week. We will notify you at the end of this presentation, and probably later today or tomorrow, and follow up with you, offer um, additional information, answer any questions. In addition to, we will let you know when this webcast is available via the Nudesic website so that you can share it with your colleagues as you need to. Um, so if everybody is ready, please um, turn your uh, your seat to green, and we'll make sure we're good to go. And um, all being all things going well, we are now going to turn this presentation over to Rick Garibay. Rick. Well, thank you very much, Dion, for the kind introduction. Thank you all for taking the time out of your day to join us uh, for a discussion on service-oriented architecture with Windows Communication Foundation. Uh, I plan to take you today through a number of topics to kind of set the stage for um, why we're talking about service-oriented architecture, um, where we are and where we've come from. I'm going to talk about um, services, service-oriented architecture, and service-oriented applications. Um, then we'll get into an introduction to Windows Communication Foundation. I have a couple of demos uh, prepared for you today. And then, time permitting, we'll talk about some strategies and approaches that you can apply to real-world SOA. And then we'll wrap up with any questions that you might have. A little bit about myself, as Dion mentioned, I'm a consultant with the Connected Systems Development Practice at Udesic, and I am a Connected Systems Microsoft MVP. So let's take a look at a brief history of software engineering, <clears throat> where we see the historical relationship between software engineering and the reduced coupling between hardware and software over time. So what we see is a continuing trend um, gnawing away or chipping away at the same problem, which is how to determine what to be coupled with and how to decouple the right aspects. So if you look at one extreme way back in the 40s and 50s, where we had electromechanical computers where the, go, the code was literally bound uh, directly to the hardware via sprockets and dials. And as we evolve over each decade, each decade brings with it a significant advancement in technology, which is really a result of chipping away at that coupling problem. So assembly language allowed us to um, tie code directly to hardware, procedural languages, offered a nice layer of abstraction um, over that. Then we moved into um, high-level compilation, object orientation, components, and eventually services. The primary motivation, um, it turns out, for moving from procedural programming to objects was really all about reuse and thus um, improved productivity. Um, at times, however, reuse is at the expense of productivity due to the white box nature of classic objects. And what I mean by white box uh, reuse is in a white box reuse model, 
Developers must be intimate with object class internals, often within all levels of an inheritance chain. That results in the client code being tightly bound to the implementation, and changes in one generalized class can have hidden and sometimes severe impact to client code. Black box reuse, on the other hand, simply requires that the developer understand the contract or the interface that he or she is programming against, because interfaces provide a nice separation between the definition and the implementation. And the result is a, is a sort of binary shield uh, between the client and the service or the consumer of some kind of functionality where the client really knows nothing about that implementation. So if we look at some recent developments um, over the last few decades, C++ was a great example of white box reuse where we had the ability to communicate between objects within the same process and those objects then could become reused. Moving into a black box reuse, we had COM, which allowed us to communicate between components in different processes on the same machine. And moving into um, future technologies that provided location transparency, we had distributed COM, which basically is built upon COM and allows us to communicate between components in different processes on different machines. COM Plus, which allows us to communicate between components in different processes on different machines, and addresses new and difficult design goals, such as availability, performance, security, transactions, et cetera, et cetera. And then, um, not too um, uh, recently, we had .NET Remoting and ASP.NET Web Services, which continue to build upon um, the concepts of black box reuse and location transparency, allowing us to communicate between components in different processes on different machines and contend with the same implementation uh, uh, features that are required in the COM Plus world. In .NET Remoting and .NET ASP.NET Web Services or ASMX services, however, something interesting happened. We were able to uh, continue to address the design goals that we had um, within the COM Plus timeframe in a proprietary manner and provide an interoperable story for getting the best of and interoperability through ASP.NET Web Services. So this communication foundation is the latest release within the Microsoft platform that really unifies the mean, means by which com, uh, components, excuse me, in different processes on different machines communicate and simplifies the various implementations for addressing design goals in a standard manner. So that's really the big news with Windows Communication Foundation is it really provides um, the bedrock um, uh, and, and the foundation for building service-oriented application um, and service-oriented architectures today. So let's talk a little bit more about services, service-oriented architecture, and service-oriented applications. In general, um, anybody that's interested in SOA or has done any kind of studying around SOA or understands the motivation for moving from objects to components understands that coupling is a bad thing. Uh, we, we strive as architects and developers to build applications that are loosely coupled, and, 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 we, and we, we speak very proudly of that. But the reality is that coupling, to some extent, is unavoidable. If you're not coupled to anything at all, then you can't really add much value. So the question is, what do you couple yourself to, and how do you build distributed architectures that are flexible? So services, I believe, are the next evolution from components, just as interface-based components were an evolution from objects. And to the best of our knowledge, I believe that service-oriented architecture is the premier way to build distributed applications that are maintainable where the right aspects are decoupled, uh, bringing you things like interoperability, portability, productivity, maintainability, extensibility, and real reuse. And some might argue that web services are really nothing new. We've been doing web services here for a number of years. And, and that is a true statement, but interoperability um, in the pre-WCF and uh, web services extension um, uh, time frame is really at the expense of reliability. Um, HTTP, which is really the only choice that you have in first generation web services, can certainly be limiting. And the reality is that unfortunately uh, for some, ASP.NET web services and web services enhancements have really been deprecated by Microsoft. The focus now is really in providing WS star uh, support um, across the Microsoft stack and the tool set that Microsoft is investing um, to do that is Windows Communication Foundation. And Windows Communication Foundation um, supports a number of relevant specifications via this concept of a binding that we're going to talk about a little bit more. Um, some of these bindings are shown um, on the screen in front of you. The basic HTTP binding is basically the binding that allows you to 
um, be compatible with the uh, WS interoperability basic profile, with a which ASP.NET Web Services um, supports out of the box. For more advanced uh, specifications and standards, such as WS Secure Conversation, um, WS Reliable Messaging, and WS Atomic Transactions, for example, there's a binding called WS HTTP binding that is provided out of the box for um, giving you the ability to use some of those additional features. Um, if you go to the link that's shown at the bottom of the screen here, you'll see that the uh, page reads like a menu of capabilities that then group those capabilities into uh, binding choices. So I encourage you to check out um, that page to get a full understanding of the breadth uh, of what is supported within Windows Communication Foundation rather than the box. So really when we think about service-oriented architecture, we're talking about the convergence of software usability and communication. And that's really the story here when we talk about service-oriented architecture and really what the difference between first-generation web services that had a, a great story around interoperability but lacked um, that, uh, that story in reliability, uh, reusability, and communication. So some characteristics within services that are important to understand is that within services, we're still talking about languages like C-sharp or VB.net or whatever language it is that you might develop with. We're talking about technologies such as the .NET flame, framework, excuse me, and platforms uh, such as Windows Server. We still deal with things like version numbers and, uh, you know, deployment and versioning, et cetera, et cetera. But the key difference is that between services, all of those things are really not relevant, and that's really where you gain the interoperability story within service-oriented architecture. Because within ser between services, you're dealing with things like communication channels, some of which might be interoperable depending on the scenario, some may not. You're dealing with policies, which are going to provide um, information to consumers as to what level of support that service may provide around transactions, security, reliability, et cetera. We communicate those capabilities over contracts using uh, USDL or Web Services Description Language, and everything that um, uh, gets passed back and forth between a service is in the form of a SOAP message. There's some tenets of service orientation that are important to um, touch briefly upon any time that we're having a discussion on service-oriented architecture because there's a lot of differing opinions as to what um, SOA is or isn't, but there are four tenets that seem to be widely um, accepted. The first tenant is that boundaries are explicit. And what that means is that as a consumer, when I go to interact or do business with a service, I have the concept of an endpoint that is very explicit um, in, in understanding how to interact with that service. A service may host um, one or several endpoints, but there really isn't a different way to interact with that service than um, going through uh, the endpoint. So that's an example of boundaries being explicit. Services are autonomous, which means that a service should be uh, designed and design goals for a service should be that you be able to pick up that service and really drop it on any um, hosting infrastructure, and it should work just as well as it did in any other um, scenario. It's also in, interesting to note that, that services and, and the autonomy of service services really um, um, imply a change in perspective from a consumer um, standpoint, and that the autonomy of services is both a strength and a weakness, and that services can be up and services can be down. So the onus is really on the client of services to understand that there is some volatility between um, the client, which might be residing in, in one process, and a service that might be re residing in a process uh, uh, on the same machine, on a different machine on the network, or, you know, across the world. Services share schema and contract, not class, which is really the point of the last slide and, and, and really understanding that, you know, classes and interfaces and exceptions, those are all, you know, object-oriented concepts. Um, .NET oriented concepts that really don't apply to service orientation. So services will share schema um, and messaging to communicate, uh, not class. And last but not least, again, is the compatibility is based on policy. You have no guarantee that a service supports transactions or a given security model or, or, or provides, you know, support for WS uh, reliable messaging unless the service explicitly says that it is. And even the service is going to perform uh, certain uh, functionality, and there's also expectations on the client to be able to comply with that policy. So let's talk a little bit about Windows Communication Foundation and how Windows Communication Foundation um, is a tool for realizing this, this exciting um, world of service-oriented applications and service-oriented architecture. 
WCF is Microsoft's implementation of industry standards to provide a communication sound, uh, subsystem that enables applications across multiple machines or processes to communicate. As such, WCF is a core component in the .NET Framework 3.0 and 3.5, which comes with Windows Vista and Windows Server 2008, and is also supported by Windows Server 2003, along with XP, um, Service Pack 2, and later. The WCF API, as we've been talking about and building up to, unifies um, ASP.NET Web Services, .NET Remoting, distributed transactions and messaging into a single unified programming model that makes true service orientation tenable, and thus guarantees interoperability based on the scenarios that you are designing for. WCF is fundamental to .NET because .NET really is the premier way to build distributed applications today, and Microsoft's investment um, in taking distributed um, architectures to the next level is within Windows Communication Foundation. So the Windows Communication Foundation story already today um, is very strong. It's in its second version, and it's only going to get stronger and stronger as uh, service orientation continues to proliferate throughout the enterprise. So a quick word about .NET 3.0 and .NET 3.5 for anybody that might be um, wondering, because there is some confusion around uh, what exactly it is, so I'll take just a moment to clarify that. Um, now, .NET 3.0 and .NET 3.5 are added into the .NET um, framework. Both use and require the .NET 2.0 common language runtime exclusively. So if you look at the diagram here, you see the .NET 2.0 CLR and the .NET 2.0 components, which, which contain all the things that we're probably all pretty familiar with, whether it's Windows Forms, ASP.NET, ADO.NET, uh, the ability to build console applications. Uh, .NET Framework 3.0 is really additive to um, the .NET 2.0 framework and provides additional components and functionalities such as Windows Workflow, Windows Presentation Foundation, Windows Card Space, and obviously Windows Communication Foundation. So the .NET Framework 3.5 kind of builds along the same lines and adds some improvements to the aforementioned technologies, but also introduces um, language um, improvements uh, such as language integrated query, um, full support for, for AJAX, um, and additional um, communication protocols for uh, conducting messaging, uh, such as REST, and uh, much, much more. So WCF, from a packaging perspective, really uh, comes down to two assemblies. The first is system.servicemodel.dll, which is really the um, assembly that does the majority of the heavy lifting, and then system.runtime.serialization, which is used for serializing uh, C Sharp or VB.NET or any .NET type to its runtime or wire format, excuse me, um, equivalent. And these are the two assemblies that you'll reference and, 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 and work with as you uh, build uh, Windows Communication Foundation um, services and applications. So let's talk about the ABCs of WCF. Anytime that you're talking about WCF, you'll hear um, these terms um, that, that are almost ubiquitous with Windows Communication Foundation. A WCF service can be thought of the combination of an address, a binding, and a contract. So every WCF service has this uh, characteristic called an address, and an address, as you might um, imagine, uniquely identifies a service. It provides within the URI the transport protocol, i.e., HTTP or TCP IP, maybe name pipes or MSMQ, and the name of the target machine or the host that's actually hosting that service, and exposing that service for consumption, and a port if applicable. So here's some examples of what some URIs or URLs might look like for an address. In addition to an address, every WCF service has a binding. We talked a little bit about bindings. Bindings kind of provide canned policies that implement the WCF features required to support the design goals of the system. Some common bindings include basic HTTP binding, which we talked about provides um, the compatibility for ASP.NET Web Services, which support the um, Web Service Interoperability Basic Profile 1 uh, specification, and more advanced bindings, such as WSHTTP binding, which provide uh, more advanced security scenarios, specifications such as uh, WS reliable messaging, um, transactions across um, you know, any transport, such as um, uh, HTTP, TCP, for example, uh, which is brought to you via uh, WS atomic transactions. Every WCF service also has the concept of a contract, and there are a number of contracts that you'll use and work with um, when you're building a WCF service. 
a service contract is used to expose the service, and we're going to do a demo that actually shows you how to do that. And within each service, there's actually operations that also must be opted in to participate in that service contract. One of the things that I mentioned early on in the presentation is that in uh, service-oriented applications and service-oriented architectures, boundaries are explicit. So everything um, within a service is really opt-in. So the fact that you have to um, opt in a interface, as we'll see as a service contract, means you also have to opt in as corresponding members. Along the same lines, if you want to use a business entity as a uh, you know, data transport object, for example, you must specify that entity as a data contract so that it notifies the um, uh, WCF uh, runtime that it is, in fact, a business identity that wishes to be um, serialized. And then also you have fault contracts. Fault contracts define error handling semantics in an interoperable manner. So just as um, from a service-oriented perspective, there really isn't a concept of a class that you might use in .NET, C Sharp, or VB.NET to um, describe what a business entity or data uh, transport object looks like. There's no concept of an exception either. But that doesn't keep um, you know, the reality of things going wrong within service execution from happening. We just need a way to express that in a truly interoperable way. And that's really what a fault contract does. A fault contract allows you to continue to handle errors and exceptions within the service. Remember that we talked about the characteristics within services still being you know, languages, platforms, technologies, et cetera, and just expressing that um, error in an interoperable manner. There's actually a fifth type of contract that I'm not showing here, and that's called the message contract. The message contract basically gives you a lot more control um, over what the uh, message looks like, which is always going to be SOAP. Um, and I don't mention it here because it is a little bit of an esoteric um, uh, technique that you may or may not um, ever run into based on, on um, how deep you go uh, with WCF. Last but not least, every WCF service must be hosted. And you have a number of hosting options. And the only requirement um, for hosting a WCF service is that you actually host it in either IIS or a .NET um, process. So that's actually kind of interesting because you can host a WCF service in um, IIS 5 or 6 or IIS 7 and um, a new hosting environment called Windows Activation um, Services that ships with IIS and Windows Vista and Windows Server 2008. But you can also host a WCF service using a uh, smart client, a console, a Windows service, um, or a regular Windows form. And any time that you are not hosting a WCF service within IIS or Windows Activation Services, it's referred to as self-hosting because you're kind of providing the hosting infrastructure yourself, hosting the service, and then making it available um, for consumption. And we'll talk more about hosting. But together, all three of these elements, the address, the binding, and the contract, form a triumvirate that is called an endpoint. And the unit of deployment for a WCF service is an endpoint, and services are then deployed, discovered, and consumed as endpoints. So if you're a client and you're going to be interacting with a WCF service, you'll basically need the information within an endpoint in order to generate the corresponding proxy and plumbing on the client side to be able to interact with that WCF service. So conceptually speaking, um, what makes um, WCF um, tick is really this concept of interception. So if you look at the conceptual architecture on the screen, you see a number of processes. You see client um, in process A that's communicating with the service in the same process. And you also have that same client communicating with two other services, each in different processes. So you might look at um, you know, the, the client in process A as sending a message to the service that is in that same process over a uh, name pipe uh, or IPC endpoint. And that same client may also communicate with a service in a different process using HTTP or MSMQ. Clients always interact with a proxy, and the proxy basically is responsible for serializing the stack frame from the wire format, excuse me, to the wire format, which would be SOAP um, in each case, and sends the message down the, the channel stack um, down to the transport channel. So the transport channel then on the client side is responsible for sending that serialized message to the host, which in turn receives the message, performs any pre-processing via host channels that would be, um, you know, corresponding to the um, client um, channel stack, and then it has a um, dispatcher which actually converts the message that's coming across as text or SOAP to a stack frame and calls the object um, that the service is hosting. 
and to send a response, the you know process is reversed. So it's important to understand that that, that from an interception perspective, um, the client and the service have their own um, what's called uh, stacks. The client has a client channel and transport stack, and the service has its own equivalent uh, stack. And those stacks have to be compatible in order for a client and a service to communicate. So the client, in order to communicate over name pipes or HTTP or MSMQ, has to have the equivalent uh, stack on the client side in order to uh, perform that messaging. And that's all provided via this concept of a proxy, which really deal, shields the client itself from understanding the um, plumbing that goes into um, communicating. So let's take a look at some code here. Um, service contracts, as we discussed um, earlier, um, are, 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 are basically expressed as uh, .NET interfaces along with the service contract attribute class to explicitly define a contract. So here we have a very simple interface um, in C Sharp uh, called um, iPersonnel Action. And to make that interface a service contract or a service, I simply decorate it with the service contract attribute. And what you'll notice here is I'm using system.servicemodel, which is the namespace that maps to the system.servicemodel.dll. In addition to um, opting that interface in as a service contract, I also have to use the operation contract attribute to opt in each corresponding method. So in this example, I might have a method called adjust salary that returns a double amount and takes as a parameter an employee ID, a base salary, and the percent to adjust that salary. And this might be a um, service for a, you know, human resources line of business um, application. And you'll see also that we have a method called promote that takes a employee ID, but that promote method is not part of the contract, and that's okay. This um, interface may have been, you know, defined before we're even thinking about uh, Windows Communication Foundation, or there might just be a decision that we don't want to expose the promote uh, method to the rest of the world. And that's exactly why each method um, must be opted in by the operation contract. To implement a service contract is exactly the same way that you might expect that you implement any other um, .NET interface. You simply define a concrete type, in this case, HR Manager Service, implement iPersonnel action, and away you go. While it is possible and supported within Windows Communication Foundation to go ahead and decorate your concrete class with the service contract um, attribute, disciplined developers should really maintain the separation of contract from implementation. This is the best practice if you understand the benefits of interface-based uh, programming and the reason that um, you know, it makes sense to separate your definition from your implementation, you kind of want to leverage that within um, service-oriented um, applications that you're building. So while this is fully supported, it certainly um, is not a best practice, at least in my opinion. So let's jump into a demo. Um, within this demo, I'm just going to basically create um, a simple WCF service uh, from some existing um, code just to show you how easy it is to take everything you've learned um, in .NET um, and create a um, web service uh, using Windows Communication Foundation, and I'll show you how to host and consume um, that service. So I'm going to go ahead and break out of my presentation here, and I'm going to go ahead and pop into uh, my, my PC console. And if anybody has a hard time um, seeing this, if you'll just notify um, Dion, we'll make sure that we get you squared away. Anybody not see uh, Visual Studio Team System 2008 right now? Okay. Dion, I'll go ahead and proceed unless uh, you're getting feedback otherwise. No, I think we're good. I'm going to notify somebody right now. Okay, excellent. So what I have here is a Visual Studio 2008 solution. I have a um, class library called HR Service, and I have a console application called Client. So let's take a look at this HR uh, Service project. Within that HR Service project, you'll notice that I've got um, pretty much the common references that you get um, right out of the box when you create a class library. There's really nothing about WCF here. You don't see system.service model 
You don't use system.runtime civilization. I have an interface here called iPersonnel Action. And that interface um, is very similar to the interface definition that we um, looked at in the um, slides, and I'll move this over just a little bit. It consists of an adjust salary method that we went over that takes an employee ID, the current salary of that employee, and a percentage to um, adjust that salary, hopefully in the upwards direction. It also has a promote method um, that takes a single um, employee ID. And you'll notice that there's an adjust salary overload that's currently commented out, and I'll come back to that later and explain um, why that is. So let me go over um, the implementation of this component, which again has nothing to do with WCF. I'm simply um, dealing with uh, plain old C-sharp um, and, and .NET right now. I've taken HR service and I've implemented iPersonnel Action, which is the interface that we just looked at. And you'll see that the implementation here is very simple. For adjust salary, I'm simply taking the salary that was passed in and adjusting it by the percentage and returning that salary. For the promote implementation, I'm always returning true, which is nice for that employee. And for the um, overload adjust salary that actually doesn't exist in the interface, I'm basically implementing it identically to the adjust salary method. So the implementation here is very simple, and that's not really the point of this demo. The, the, the implementation of each uh, method really is immaterial to um, what I'm trying to show here. Obviously, the implementation in a production scenario would probably be dealing with transactions and databases and, you know, more complicated business processes than what I'm outlining here. So let's take a look at the client um, project. And the client project basically consists of a console application that's going to prompt the user for an employee ID, the current salary, and the percentage to increase. And then it's going to simply instantiate the HR service as an object and call the adjust salary method on that object. So nothing really uh, interesting or special going on here. I'll just point out that it is referencing the HR service, which at this point is just supplying an old um, .NET um, assembly. So let me go ahead and um, build the client. And we'll go ahead and start it. Okay, so I have um, the console application prompting me for an employee ID, and I'll just enter uh, something simple like one, two, three, four, five. The current salary um, we can just enter as uh, fifty thousand, and then we'll provide it an adjustment percent. Um, and this employee has done a pretty good job, so we'll go ahead and do ten percent. So nothing too exciting, but as you might expect based on the implementation of the adjust salary method. The return from the adjust salary method is 55,000, um, which I believe is um, arithmetically correct. So again, nothing too exciting there. So what I want to show you now is how easy it is to leverage your existing skills in C Sharp and .NET or VB.NET if you're a VB.NET um, developer, and really um, take those skills and leverage them to take it to the next step, which is building Windows Communication Foundation services. So the first thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to add a reference to the assemblies that we talked about. And that assembly for um, the purpose of this demo is going to be system.servicemodel. I'm not going to deal with system.runtimeserialization for this particular demo yet. And once I've added um, that reference, I now have the ability to convert this regular C-sharp interface into a fully blown WCF service. And so there's just a couple of steps that I need to take in order to do that. The first is I'm going to add a reference to system.servicemodel. And once I've done that, I now have the ability to work with the attributes that we talked about, which include service contract, which I'm going to decorate the iPersonnel action interface with. 
And then because I do want to expose the adjust salary um, method as an operation, I'm going to go ahead and add an operation contract attribute as well. Okay. I'm going to go ahead and save that. I'm going to just uh, compile really quickly here. I'm going to pop back into HR service. I just want to point out that I'm not going to do a thing to the implementation of iPersonal Action. As far as iPersonal Action is concerned, it has absolutely nothing to do with WCF. So now what I want to do is I want to actually take this service and I want to host it. So one of the things that I need to do in order to do that is to provide configuration to tell service model or the service host how to host this application, which is a service. So I'm going to go ahead and include this app.config file that I prepared previously. I'm just going to go over some key elements here. First of all, we've got this system.servicemodel um, element, which consists of some behaviors and some services. I'm going to focus on the services first, and I have one service here that is named northwind.humanresources.services.hrservice, and we'll see that the endpoint consists of the ABC that we talked about. So the endpoint consists of an address, that is HTTP localhost HR service. I'm using the basic HTTP binding uh, because I'm just basically going to build a WS interoperability basic profile one service. And I'm going to leverage um, the iPersonnel action contract for that service. In addition, I've defined what's called a service behavior, which basically um, allows me to config the service um, for hosting. And I'm making a decision that despite the default behavior in WCF, which is to um, turn off the exposure of uh, metadata, uh, i.e. Uh, WSDL. I'm going to go ahead and, and enable that, and I'm going to go ahead and expose that uh, metadata over the same um, URL. So I'm going to go ahead and build this. And within Visual Studio um, 2008, there's a couple of, of neat little utilities um, that are new. The first one um, is called WCF um, Service Host. And what this is is a really lightweight, lean and mean um, hosting environment that you can use during debugging, um, which just saves you um, the time to create your own host. Um, creating a host in WCF is a really simple um, exercise. It's about five lines of code. But this is just a nice, neat utility that allows you to um, get that um, service bootstrap up and running so that you can program and test against it. And you can find um, WCF service hosts within the uh, Common 7 IDE folder within Visual Studio um, 2008's uh, folder. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to drop down to uh, my command line. I'm going to show you how to um, host the service that we just created. So when I compiled that service, I compiled it down into uh, a DLL called hrservice.dll, and we just um, brought in the corresponding configuration um, in the app.config file. When that compiled down um, after this last compilation, basically what it did was um, create the uh, corresponding assembly called hrservice.dll, and then copied that application um, configuration file and renamed it to hrservice.dll.config. Um, so to use WCF service host, I simply provide it with the service parameter and the config parameter. I'll go ahead and hit enter. So at this point in time, I get a nice little pop-up that indicates to me that the service has been hosted. I can click that, and I can see that there is a service that is, in fact, hosted. And there's really nothing else to um, this tool. It's just a really quick way to, to get your service hosted for um, development and debugging um, purposes. So what I want to do now is I want to go ahead and just go to the service. And I just want to verify that it's working. And the way that I can do that is by viewing the actual WSDL definition of the metadata exchange that has been exposed. And what that tells me is that there is an adjust salary um, operation that is supported by um, this service. And that's exactly what I um, want to know about because what I want to do now to finish up this demo is I want to go ahead and wire up my client that was talking to a component within the same process 
to leverage the service that's now being hosted in a completely different process. And that service just happens to be on this machine, but of course, the service could be hosted anywhere, on a different machine, on the same network, on, on the internet, um, you know, in, an, in the extranet. Um, really, the sky's the limit. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to go ahead and um, drop down into my client, and I'm going to remove the reference to HR service. So at this point, if I tried to deploy, excuse me, build uh, the client project, I would get an exception because there is no longer a reference to um, the um, HR service. So instead what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and uh, copy and paste this URL here. I'm going to go back into my project, and on references, I'm going to right-click references and add a service reference. And I'm going to use the address that provides me with all of the information within the endpoint, which consists of the address, the binding, and the contract. And I'm going to go ahead and name it HR service. If I hit go, what will happen is a discovery process within Visual Studio uh, 2008. It finds the HR service, and I'm going to go ahead and add that as a service reference. So what's happening right now is Visual Studio is actually taking the WSDL information and it's creating the proxy that's, that's required to support the ability to communicate with the service that I just hosted. And so what we'll see here is the reference to um, HR service. And Visual Studio has also gone ahead and created a corresponding configuration file for me that consists of equivalent binding information that I'm going to need in order to communicate with the service. And this is what's referred to in WCF as binding equivalence. Binding equivalence simply means that if I'm a client and I'm going to communicate with a service, I have to have an equivalent binding on both the client and the service side in order to make that happen. And the reason that that's important is because um, if you re re recall the conversation we had around interception, um, both the client and the service use the signing information to build a corresponding fact in order to communicate and exchange messages. So now I'm going to go ahead and drop into uh, my program, and I've got a little compiler warning in here that's um, letting me know that the um, namespace no longer exists. So I'm just going to go ahead and, and overwrite that namespace with my new namespace which is client.hr service. The reason that it's client.hr service is that by default there's some behaviors that uh, w, uh, Visual Studio uses when creating um, a proxy. And if you ever want to look at actually what's generated, you can drop down into um, the belly of the beast, if you will, and uh, you'll see here that it just went ahead and took the name of my project, which was client, the name of the um, namespace that I provided, and just built it out that way. You'll also see but there's a number of types here, including iPersonnel Action, iPersonnel Action Channel, and iPersonnel Action Client. We're going to use iPersonnel, uh, I'm sorry, Personnel Action Client that actually implements um, iPersonnel Action to actually have a conversation now with the service that we're hosting. So let me go back to the program, and let me get rid of this call here. I'm going to replace that with personnel action client, which represents the proxy. I'm going to call this instance of personal action client proxy. And I'm just going to new that up. And now all I have to do is basically replace the service instance with the new proxy instance. Let me go ahead and compile. I get a clean compile. And now what I'm going to do is I'm just simply going to execute um, the client and just show that we're actually communicating with the service. So to do so, I'm going to right click on client, I'm going to go ahead and debug, start new instance. So I'll enter an employee ID, I'll enter a salary, and an adjustment percent. And you'll notice a brief pause at this point, and that's because there was actually serialization, deserialization, and transmission process that took place between the client that was on a completely different process than the WCF service. So in this demo, just to summarize what I've done, is I've taken a very simple um, class library that had absolutely nothing to do with WCF. I added the system.service model um, assembly reference. 
I opted in the C Sharp interface as a service contract and corresponding operation contract. I went ahead and hosted that service using the WCF service host that comes uh, with the Visual Studio 2008 tools. And then I just rewired up my client to consume that service. Let me just go ahead and reshare my deck. So let's talk a little bit more about hosting because what I've shown you right now is a very common um, practice that you will take when you are hosting WCF services for um, development, but it certainly isn't a production caliber um, solution, right? You'd only use WCF service host if you just wanted a quick and dirty, you know, hosting environment. So we talked about the support for um, WCF across a number of operating systems. Within Windows um, XP Service Pack 2, you actually can host um, WCF services in IS5, Windows Forms, a .NET console, or a Windows service. And so unless you're doing, um, you know, anything that's just kind of playing around and just kind of getting your um, feet wet, there's a real good chance that you're either going to use IIS or Windows service um, to actually host that WCF service. You can also leverage Windows Server 2003, which is the environment that I'm actually using today to provide my demos. Um, and I'm going to show you how to actually take a very similar service and host that in IIS 6. But you could just as simply do it in .NET Windows Forms, a .NET console application, or a Windows service. It's interesting to note that the WCF um, uh, service host um, that's provided as a tool is nothing more than just a Windows Forms application that provides a very limited, um, you know, primitive um, user interface for letting you know that it is actually hosting the service for you. It really is no different than if you wanted to um, go ahead and host that um, in a console application. The main reason um, that people use Windows services um, today in WCF deployments is because IIS 7, um, you know, has barely kind of uh, come out with Windows um, Server 2008, um, and IIS is actually limited to HTTP. So if you want to take advantage of, you know, the transport and communication advantages that Windows Communication Foundation provides, such as TCP IP, MSMQ, Pipe for you know intra-process communication. You can't you can't use IIS um, five or six um, for that, but you can use the Windows service. Uh, Windows service basically provides um, you know all of the um, compatibility in terms of transport, but also has some nice management benefits um, such as the ability to start, stop, um, and restart the service as opposed to having a you know console application or or a Windows form uh, application that you'd have to manage the um, lifetime of manually. So within Windows Vista, the story is very similar um, to uh, Windows Server 2008. You can use IIS 7 and Windows Activation um, Services. And Windows Activation Services is actually a premier um, uh, first-class host for Windows Communication Foundation, which provides all of the ease of use of IIS for um, hosting mm -hmm. your services, has the benefit of you know, message-based activation for managing your resources um, appropriately, and supports every uh, you know, transport available. Of course, you can continue to self-host in uh, Windows Vista as well. Um, and last but not least, Windows Server 2008 provides the server um, complementary um, tool set for uh, Windows Vista. So let's talk about data contracts, and then we'll jump into our last demo. So a data contract, as we discussed previously, we simply marked as an entity or class as a participant in a service contract and service um, operation using the data contract attribute class. So here I have an employee that might inherit from person, and I've gone ahead and defined that employee as a data contract. And I'm basically telling WCF um, uh, via the system.runtime serialization namespace that I want to go ahead and serialize or take uh, this employee from a memory representation into a Y representation using XML and SOAP. Each data contract, um, you know, entity will consist of properties um, that must be public in order to be exposed um, to, uh, you know, the service. And so to uh, expose a property um, publicly, you must use the data member um, attribute um, as shown here. So now I want to show you um, how to, you know, apply the same um, uh, techniques that we use to um, build our first WCF service and simply host that service in um, IIS. So 
So I'm now back in um, my uh, virtual PC environment. If anybody has a hard time seeing this, please uh, notify Dion um, accordingly. So here I have a very similar um, solution that consists of a client and a, another project. And in this case, the project is a WCF um, service for web deployment. And so I've just basically named this HR service um, IIS. It's very much identical to the example that I showed you before with two very um, subtle differences. The first difference is that it now uses a web.config file as opposed to an app.config file. And this should be consistent with anybody that's done, um, you know, ASP.NET uh, web services uh, uh, development or ASP.NET development versus, you know, Windows form or console development. Uh, for anything that's web, you use a web.config. For anything that's not, you use an app.config um, pretty much. So the configuration is um, pretty much identical. And what you have here um, that you might notice as well is the addition of a .svc file. So you have hrservice.svc. This basically is just a marker file that tells IIS that when a request comes in for a .svc, to go ahead and delegate that to uh, the WCF uh, runtime. And again, if anybody's on, um, you know, ASP.NET Web Services, this is the equivalent of the .asmx extension. And it really just consists of a directive called Service Host that provides the um, implementation of the actual service, which in this case hasn't changed. It's still HR service. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to leverage this, um, uh, you know, web uh, WCF template. And just so that you're aware, the way that you would create this template um, type is you would basically just go to File, New, Project. You would select Web under your language of choice. And if you select WCF Service Application, it will create the um, service using this, this template type. Okay, so what I'm going to do now is I'm just going to bring up um, IIS, make sure that I don't have uh, any um, services deployed there, and I don't. And so I'm just going to uh, right-click the project, and I'm going to, I'm going to uh, click Publish, which is a nice feature in Visual Studio that just allows you to publish out um, a service, which really all it's doing, right, is just taking a X copy of the um, working folder and just moving that out to um, IIS and going ahead and creating a... Um, IS application for you. So I'm just going to stick with the default um, options here, and I'll go ahead and click Publish. It looks like that succeeded. So I'm going to go ahead and jump into computer management in IIS. I'm going to go ahead and refresh that. I know I see this HR service um, application, which consists of the HR service by SBC the web.config, and within the bin folder, I basically have my DLL. This is a debug build, so you'll also see um, PDBs um, for debugging symbols. So I'm going to right-click HR service, and I need to do two things in order to finish this deployment. The first thing I need to do is uh, make sure that I selected uh, ASP.NET version 2.0 in ASP.NET on the ASP.NET tab. And the last thing I want to do is just set it to uh, scripts and executables from an execution permission perspective. I'll hit apply. I'll hit OK. And now I'm just going to right click HR uh, service.svc and I'm going to click browse. Okay, and so what I get is a very familiar screen if you've done ASP.NET uh, uh, web services development, which I've always called the, you know, hello world, your service deployed correctly page, right? So it's, um, it's a, a very familiar, at least should be, 
Um, and if I click this link here, it'll actually show me the uh, metadata or WSL information, which is identical to what we saw in a self, um, self-hosting um, um, environment. So nothing's really changed here. Um, the only difference is that we've added a .sbc file and hosted the um, service in IIS. So now what I want to do is I want to show you how to um, leverage uh, data contracts um, within WCS to maybe pass in more rich, more rich parameters and also pass out um, richer parameters. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to go into my iPersonnel action um, um, interface, and I'm going to uncomment this uh, adjust salary method. And you'll notice that adjust salary takes an employee instead of an employee ID, which is a contrived example, but all I'm trying to show you is um, how to use complex types as opposed, as opposed to simple types. If I right-click the uh, employee type and go to definition, we go to this employee class here. I've already added uh, system.runtime serialization, which is the namespace that's used for um, uh, defining data contracts. So now that all that's left for me to do is to actually provide the appropriate attributes to each of the types, in this case data contract. I'm going to go ahead and just opt in um, a number of these here, these properties. So I'll do data member for the name property, the employee ID property, maybe the base salary property. I may choose not to expose term date and hire date, right? That might be a, a decision that I've made either from a security perspective or just, just not ready to um, expose that. And once I've done that, I will go ahead and build my solution once again. I'm going to go ahead and publish um, the service again. Okay. And so just a, a quick, a quick um, uh, recap here is while I do have a adjust salary um, method defined within my iPersonnel um, action interface, I really haven't done anything different because I haven't exposed that, um, op that method as an operation. In fact, if I go back to my service definition and hit refresh, I still only have a single uh, salary. So let me change that. Let me go ahead and opt this adjust salary method in as an operation contract. It's simply an overload. I'll go ahead and uh, build once again. Go ahead and redeploy. So now that the um, changes to the service have been deployed, I'm going to go ahead and go back to uh, my Internet Explorer window. And when I hit refresh, what I'm going to expect is an exception. There's this uh, great invention known as cache that kind of sometimes screws up demos. Um, the exception that I'm expecting is um, the following, which um, is basically telling me that I can't have two operations in the same contract with the same name of method adjust salary and adjust salary. Um, because there's a violation of a rule. And if you recall, um, you know, some of the tenants that we talked about, one being boundaries are um, explicit, services share schema and contract or class, this is a perfectly legal thing to do within .NET C Sharp or VB.NET. I basically overloaded the adjust salary, and the only difference between the first adjust salary and the second adjust salary is the introduction of a strongly typed employee. But Overloading is purely a object-oriented uh, concept and has nothing to do with service orientation. So it's not legal for me to expose a method given the same um, name or an operation given the same name because then I can't assume that the consumer of the service, you know, understands or even cares about this concept of, you know, um, uh, uh, overloading. So the fix is pretty simple. I'm just going to change the name of adjust salary to adjust salary with employee, and I'm not sure that I would choose this name for an operation, but I'm going to do it just for the purposes of this demonstration. Let me go ahead and uh, rebuild. 
I'm getting an exception um, or a build error, excuse me, because now I've actually violated the contract. And this is great, right? Because if I hadn't, uh, if, the, if the compiler hadn't told me, hey, Rick, you're violating the implementation of the contract, I would have deployed a, a, a bug. Um, and, and believe me, um, that was not uh, contrived. So once again, um, the separation from definition and implementation saves the day. So I'm just going to go ahead and take the name of the method. I'm going to go ahead and implement it by renaming the old one. I'll go ahead and compile, and now life is good once again. So now at this point, I'm going to go ahead and republish using my operation overload. I'll go ahead and refresh. And now you'll see that we have two distinct operations. One is a just salary, one is a just salary with employee. So to wrap up this demo, let me just uh, exercise the adjust salary with an employee operation. And I'm going to do that using another feature within Visual Studio 2008, uh, which is called the WCF uh, Test Client, which is just a really um, light, um, you know, quick and dirty way to exercise your um, services, uh, you know, which, which gets the job done in a situation like this. So to um, use WCF Test Client, all I have to do is provide the name of the um, service, um, or the endpoint, rather, or the address uh, to the endpoint of the service. And so I'll go ahead and do that here. You'll see WCF Test Client space, the address for um, the service that we're hosting in um, IIS, um, which I believe is HTTP, localhost, HR service, and HR service.sec. And like Visual Studio, it's taking some time to actually pull down the whistle, recreate the proxy, and expose an API in order to exercise the adjust salary with an employee method. I'll go ahead and click on that method. And I'll provide a base salary, uh, this time maybe 60000 an employee ID of 12345. And what you'll notice is that the only types that were serialized out as the parameters were the types that I explicitly opted in as data members within my data contract. So let me invoke that. And I get back the expected value of 66000 What's also a nice feature of this tool is it will actually show you the SOAP message that was sent to the service and the corresponding response. So, Dion, how are we doing on time? I know we started a little bit late. Um, do we want to wrap up with questions, or um, I've got a, a couple of, um, of slides I can share completely up to you and the audience. Um, we are at our hour mark, and I know we did start late. Um, we will include those slides in the presentation um, that we send out, the PDF version, and we will also include the slides. Um, Rick, let's do some Q&A, and then we'll include those slides afterwards, and then make sure they're included in the recording. Perfect. Okay. So um, I first want to thank everyone for taking the time to um, join us for a discussion on uh, service-oriented architecture and how WCF uh, really is a, a very simple um, way to build a truly advanced uh, second-generation web services. Um, at this point, I'd be happy to take any questions that you might have um, and, uh, you know, have a discussion around uh, what you've learned today. We do have a question, and the question is, does WCF replace ASP.NET Web Services? Um, it, it does replace ASP.NET Web Services from the perspective of uh, future investments from a Microsoft standpoint. So ASP.NET Web Services are still fully supported, will continue to be fully supported, but the limitation with ASP.NET Web Services is really that out of the box you get WS Interoperable uh, Basic Profile 1 uh, support. If you want to do things like uh, you know, WS Atomic Transactions to be able to support distributed transactions, um, advanced security scenarios, um, um, reliable messaging, 
you have to leverage um, a technology called uh, Web Service Extensions, which is actually a bolt-on technology um, that Microsoft provided to be able to, you know, kind of fill the stop gap uh, between, you know, ASP.NET Web Services and WCF. So while ASP.NET Web Services will continue to be supported in the um, distant future, you know, the investment really is um, in WCF, and I imagine that eventually, um, you know, ASP.NET Web Services will, will become deprecated. Okay. And in your experience, what do you see um, as some good first steps to transitioning? I think sometimes we all have trouble with that first initial step of anything. Yeah, that, that's a great question. Um, you know, it's, 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 it's an unfortunate fact that, uh, you know, many, uh, for all the benefits of service-oriented architecture and, and, and the flexibility um, and, and portability that you get with service-oriented um, applications, you know, there, there, there can be limited success um, to adopting a, a, a SOA strategy um, because usually one of two things happen, right? Either, um, you know, the developer um, community within an organization is really passionate about um, SOA and services, whether it's ASP.NET and services or WCF, and, and, and they find that they're starting to build, uh, you know, services for the sake of building services without any real, you know, organizational buy-in. Um, you know, the, the, the contrast to that is, is pushing, you know, SOA, you know, really from the top down, which is really going to result more, more often than not in a very expensive, um, you know, resource-expensive um, um, exercise. So, so really what, 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 what we recommend um, as a professional services organization and the way that we, um, you know, uh, have repeated success is to really start small and, and really take a middle-out approach where you start with identifying business drivers and business value that are going to allow you to directly add and tie return on investment to whatever the investment might be in SOA. So if you're going to go down the path and you want to do um, SOA and you're a Microsoft um, shop and you want to do WCF, you know, pick, pick a couple of manageable projects that you can actually use to build upon in an iterative manner and deliver value to the business and to your customers as quickly as possible, and then basically leverage that success to start to build out your um, your enterprise SOA strategy. That's a, a great response, and it's, it's always nice to start small, right? Um, okay. And we also have another question here from one of the attendees saying, Rick, I know there is another way to work around overloading web methods, which will allow you to expose different signatures for the same method. Do you know how to do it? Yeah, I think that there are some properties within um, both the um, um, operation contract um, that allow you to um, provide a different name. Um, I think it's actually called name. that would allow you to actually, you know, keep the code uh, name um, the same, but then just provide an alternate name. And that's another way that's kind of a compiler trick that you can use um, to, to actually change the name without having to change your actual code base. I mean, the whole beauty of attributes, right, is that the attributes are basically being interpreted by, you know, the .NET runtime using a technique called reflection. So by using these attributes, you're basically signaling to the runtime to perform, you know, different activities. And so there's, there's a nice little opportunity there to, you know, instruct the runtime that, you know, go ahead and, and, and take this adjust salary method, um, but actually call it, you know, adjust salary with employee, and that way you could keep your actual um, class or uh, a method name consistent as well. Okay. Alan, does that answer your question? Um, you can use your feedback tool up there to see it. Or the Q&A. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, we do have another question as well. And it says, can WCF services communicate with other vendor services? Yeah, the, the answer is, is absolutely, right? So, so WCF is, is Microsoft's investment from a service-oriented architecture perspective. And any time that you're talking about SOA, you're immediately invoking interoperability into the story, right? So, so, so if, if there wasn't a strong interoperability story with WCF, it really wouldn't be any different than .NET Remoting, right? .NET Remoting was a very robust remoting um, technology for communicating in a, in, a, in a black box, location transparent manner. But the problem, right, was that it required, you know, .NET to .NET. So WCF basically gives you the best of .NET Remoting, COM Plus, et cetera, but has a true interoperable story, um, which is based on 
policy, the fact that services um, share schema and contract not class. So as long as the service that you're communicating with, the .NET client, um, you know, exposes um, policy and, and, and complies with, you know, the tenants of, of SOA and is using, you know, is publishing their metadata using um, WSDL from a .NET perspective, uh, we can interoperate with those services. And conversely, you know, services that are maybe being composed of multiple services, as long as they're adhering to the tenants of SOA, um, we can absolutely interoperate with um, any, any platform, any technology, because, again, the whole, the whole basis of SOA is that we're not concerned with platform or technology. We're simply confirmed, concerned with, um, with schema, contract, and policy. Okay. Does that answer your question? A little bit. And I have a follow-on question with that, too, then, is um, with that interoperability, what does it get us from, in order to help us with our argument, kind of going upwards maybe and delivering a, a proposal that says we have this interoperability, therefore it will save us X or it will help us achieve X. Can you kind of speak to that a little bit? Yeah, sure. So, so a lot of our customers within the connected systems um, practice, um, you know, come to us because they have a, a number of applications that are, you know, critical to their enterprise, right? Um, but, but these applications, you know, that were built you know, maybe 5, 10, 15, 20 years ago, were never built with the idea of actually integrating with the, the enterprise, right? And so, so what you have is these application silos. And so it turns out that, that, that business processes, right, the, the, the process by which if you um, are in, um, let's just say you're in the candy bar business, right, and, and you have a website and you take, you know, orders in for candy bars and there's a, there's a whole, you know, retail inventory, procurement, um, delivery, you know, process, you know, today CIOs are actually looking at the existing investments within the enterprise and trying to figure out how they can take a business process and, and have those applications adapt to the business process as opposed to the business having to adapt to the limitations of applications, right? So what, what the interoperability story within Service-oriented architecture allows you to do is to really model your business processes across the enterprise and either build service interfaces on top of some of these, uh, you know, legacy applications or make decisions now strategically that your applications and your investments in applications will be SOA ready. And so that, that's, that's, you know, really the big motivation for interoperability because you don't necessarily always have a, a perfect world where, you know, all your applications are provided from, from a single vendor you can have. You know, so, so, some, some Microsoft um, investments, some IBM investments, et cetera, et cetera. And so so is really that common denominator that allows you to, you know, get the most value from your legacy investment and start to build on, you know, future investments in a way that's going to allow you to get the most out of, out of those investments going forward. Great. Thank you. We have a, a question as well that says, I know how to expose comments through implementation of the WS, is that WSDL, WSDL documentation attributes, which are visible in the WSDL. How do I go about exposing the comments on the client side? When, um, when you say comments, what, what do you mean by comments? I'm sorry. That's okay. Um, I need to get um, the gentleman that asked the question for some clarification. What do you mean about exposing the comments on the client side? And I believe the question had come from Bobby. I could be mistaken. I'm not really sure. Oh. Comments that are visible through IntelliSense. Okay, so, so there really isn't, um, to my knowledge, uh, that's an interesting question. Um, there really isn't, to my knowledge, a way to expose, um, you know, comments within um, an actual service to, to the client. And, and the reason for that is that that would kind of violate the, um, the, the tenet of, uh, of boundaries being explicit and, and services being autonomous, right? So, so, so the only way that, as a client, I can communicate with a service is by the metadata, right, um, the API information, if you will, application programming interface information that is exposed by the whistle, right? I, I don't want, and, and there's strength in that, there's power in that, because I don't need to know any of the additional details, right? So, so, so if I, if, if, if I knew what the comments within the actual service implementation API 
you know, look like, that then I might make decisions on the client side that would couple me more to the service than what I want. So, so I want to keep with the tenant of, of boundaries being explicit and know that as long as that service provides what it says it provides by virtue of its, you know, metadata, um, um, exchange, and, and whistle, really that's all I need to worry about. Um, does that answer your question? It's nice to hear, too, about some of the different, like you were talking about the boundaries and some of the parameters and um, some best practices and things of that nature. Right. And while we're waiting for that question, can you tell us, just that uh, from a high oak, Bobby responded and said, yes, that helps. Thank you. And if you have any other questions, I'll take this time right now. You should see the, the thank you slide right now. We're going through questions. If um, you have additional questions or we can, one other suggestion that we can do, and Rick, you can feel free to add some input to this, is we have gone to some of our clients and some of our prospects and we facilitated a brown bag lunch at your location where, you know, it's a working lunch where we can provide some assistance around these types of questions and, and do some whiteboarding and um, really roll up our sleeves and have a great discussion around your environment. Yeah, yeah, that's actually something that we do um, quite quite often. Um, I've done a number of them in, in Phoenix and, and in the Desert Mountain region. Um, it's really an opportunity for, um, you know, a team that, that, that is interested in, in a technology like WCF and just want to have, you know, we, we, can, we, can, we can do a, a presentation like this or we can do kind of an informal, you know, kind of, you know, whiteboarding, you know, um, architecture design kind of discussion. Uh, it's something that we that we're happy to offer to to kind of you know spread the word um, around technologies like WCF and get a better understanding of, of how you know you, you might want to partner um, with a partner like New Desktop to you know make your service oriented uh, service oriented architecture um, strategy a success. So that's certainly something that that we're very very happy to do. Great, thank you. We are way over our time at this point, and I want to say again, thank you, everybody, for joining us. Rick and I um, will go through the remainder of his slides that will, of course, be part of this recorded session and, of course, part of the presentation, which we will send to all of you by the end of the day today or early tomorrow, depending on schedules. I know, Rick, you, uh, you have a full day. So uh, we will get all of this information to you. And, again, my contact information is on that slide. Please feel free to reach out. We're, we're really here to serve as a resource for you and your organization. So if you need any additional information, please feel free to reach out via email or phone, whichever is best for you. Rick, any parting thoughts before we go over the remainder of the slide? No, thank you very much, Dion, and thank you, everyone, for joining us. It's been Great. a pleasure. Oh, I'm sorry, we have one last question. Oh, it says thank you. Oh, you're very welcome. Thank you all very much. So we appreciate it, and we hope you have a great rest of your day. All right, Rick, let's go through the – and please feel free. You, we're not kicking anybody out. You are free to definitely stay and, and participate in the, the last of these slides, but we understand we are running late, so if we have to go, by all means. So, Rick, go ahead. Sure. So – you know, one of, the, one of the questions that we had is, is actually, you know, how do you, how do you, how do you, you know, how do you do this mm -hmm. um, in, in the real world? And so, so I've got some slides here that that, that I think are, are pretty effective at, at kind of, you know, painting that out and, and kind of summarize, you know, what I mentioned um, um, earlier is, is really, you know, identifying business value and, and bringing business value is really the key um, to the, um, you know, implementation and adoption. Of, of, of any technology, right? Uh, we, we don't we don't um, apply technology just for technology's sake. We, we identify a business need, a business driver, and then and then merely apply technology to to provide a solution that, that hopefully solves the problem and, and helps to make an organization uh, more agile um, and profitable. So now that you've seen how easy it is to build a service-oriented application um, with Windows Communication. Foundation and Visual Studio 2008, it's really important to think carefully about how, how, how you want to proceed um, with your um, S SOA um, initiatives. And so there's, there's, there's kind of a three-step process um, that we recommend. The first, uh, and, and it consists of, of an expose, um, compose, and consume kind of chain that kind of feeds into um, each other. And by applying an expose, compose, and consume approach, 
it allows you to iterate very tightly um, over a business problem and, and, and present results in a very traceable manner um, and, and projects that are lightweight and can, and can demonstrate immediate value to um, an organization in a relatively um, short uh, period of time. So let's take a, a closer look at that. So, so within the exposed phase, um, you focus on, on what services to create from the underlying applications and data, as well as how they are constructed, right? So, so that can mean, you know, existing databases, legacy applications, line of business applications that might be a combination of, you know, Microsoft, um, you know, ASP.NET or uh, C++, maybe you've got some ASP, uh, you know, regular ASP applications out there, packaged applications, you know, different, different training partners. Once those services are created, they tend to be combined into more complex services, applications, or cross-functional business processes, right? And this is what we talked about um, in terms of, you know, being able to, to take investments in um, the enterprise and, and expose those in a meaningful way. And, and to do that, you, you leverage, you know, composition such that once services are created, they can be, you know, combined into, into that, that, that more, uh, you know, rich uh, makeup that actually allows you to leverage a number of assets um, to, to get work done. Um, and, and, and you'll hear the term orchestration and workflow, which is really just, you know, a, 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 a way to describe visually, you know, what the, uh, what the business process looks like and then map that business process to the actual units of work that are performing um, the functionality, which, again, can be any number of um, applications, services, et cetera, um, that are exposed. And finally, once you've uh, exposed your services, you've composed them in a meaningful way, now you can consume those services over a myriad of um, user interfaces and other applications um, as shown in the diagram here. So really kind of bringing it all together is, is at the end of a expose, compose, consume cycle, you should have immediate business value that addresses a, a concern or a need within the organization. It's just the foundation for kind of the rinse and repeat of that expose, com, uh, compose, and consume uh, cycle and kind of iterating over, you know, business problems and building on previous successes. So, so, so start small um, and, and start to build up. You know, don't take, uh, don't try to, to take a, a huge bite out of, um, you know, out of um, your, your enterprise and kind of, you know, blowing the ocean to figure out um, this whole SOA thing. You know, start small. Um, incrementally, you'll get there. Um, and any way that we can uh, provide assistance, absolutely, please feel free to reach out to uh, Dion and she has uh, my contact information, um, and we'll be happy to um, assist. Absolutely. And that's really about it. Great. Wonderful. And thanks, everybody, for staying with us. We see that there's still some folks here, and we appreciate that. Um, and, Rick, do you want to end with the, the thank you slide with my information on there? And again, you know, like Rick said, we're, we're really here to um, provide assistance and, and some direction. And we're not about technology for technology's sake, as cool as it can be sometimes. It's really about finding the right solution that's, that's going to work best for your environment now and, and something that will work in the future and be malleable enough to adjust. So again, thank you so much. And um, we will, again, send out this information um, the presentation in a PDF format, the recorded version will be available um, probably in about a week, and we will, again, get that out to everybody. So, again, thank you so much, and have a great rest of your day. Thank you, Dion. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Rick? Yes. Okay. What is a, a good number? I need to do a quick follow-up with you. Yep. I will um, throw the ball at 602 604 uh, 4056 out of my office. I will call you in just momentarily. Thank you.